फुट ओके और राइट सो लेट्स गेट स्टार्टेड सो टुडे वी विल टॉक अबाउट फॉल्ट टॉलरेंस वी स्टार्टेड दैट टॉपिक लास्ट टाइम इफ यू रिमेंबर लास्ट फिफ्टीन मिनट्स ऑफ द क्लास आई इंट्रोड्यूस्ड वॉट इज फॉल्ट टॉलरेंस वाई डू वी नीड इट एंड सो ऑन सो टुडे वी विल लुक एट मेनी डिफरेंट वेज टू इम्प्लीमेंट फॉल्ट टॉलरेंस एंड डिस्ट्रीब्यूटेड सिस्टम्स वी लुक एट एसेंशली द प्रॉब्लम ऑफ हाउ डू प्रोसेसिज एग्री Uh, on some computation when there is a fault we'll look at what is called the byzantine generals problem which is uh, going to address this whole issue of byzantine fault tolerance i'll uh, explain what that is we will have a brief recap of how to deal with failures from the network perspective we had talked about some of this when we did the uh, class on remote procedure call so i will recap some of that and have some new ideas there and then we will end with this problem of distributed commit okay uh, which again i'll introduce we will probably do the two phase commit today depending on time we may or may not get to the three phase okay but that's really the three things we are going to to talk about today so let's uh, skip a few of these slides that we already discussed last time uh, and get to this notion of agreement in faulty system okay so so the picture you want to keep in mind here is you have a system with n processes okay a distributed system and they need to agree on some computation that they are performing maybe they send a request and you want to make sure that the response that comes back is correct and you want to do this in the presence of some of these nodes failing okay remember last time i talked about two types of fault tolerance that we will actually look at one is called crash fault tolerance okay which means that a process can either work normally and produce correct result or it fails and it fails by crashing and once it's crashed it produces no output okay it basically stop responding because the process just crashed okay so so in this case either the if the process is up it's assumed to be correct and if the process is down it's not working at all it just stopped responding okay so this is called crash fault tolerance and then the other type of fault tolerance we are going to talk about is called byzantine fault tolerance and in byzantine fault tolerance processes continue to run even when they are faulty but they can produce arbitrary results okay byzantine faults can occur because of bad bugs in your code or maybe the code the software got hacked and then there is now a adversary who is controlling the software or the process uh, application and it can start producing arbitrary results okay so these are the two types of fault tolerance uh, that we look at let's start with crash fault tolerance okay crash fault tolerance simply says that a machine not a machine a process either works and it uh, is up it produces the right result or it crashes so how can you make a system fault tolerant to crashes i mean so you basically create replicas so you will have some number of replicas so that even if the other process other replicas crash the ones that are up can continue to produce results okay so this gets us to the notion of a k fault tolerant system is any system that can tolerate k concurrent faults and yet continue to function okay so one fault tolerance means one process crashes and it still continues to run two fault tolerance means two of the replicas okay uh, uh, that you have crash simultaneously and so, so you can have any number of replicas that might fail and depending on how robust you want to make your system you can design it to be k fault tolerant where k is any number any integer that you can pick okay so the basic idea is when you have crash fault tolerance okay you are going to essentially have k plus 1 replicas okay to tolerate k faults because you have k of these replicas failing okay and you want at least one that works because as i said if the crash fault tolerant the if the process is working or the replica is working is producing correct results okay so if you have processes that fail silently which is another way of saying this crash fault tolerance you need k plus 1 redundancy to tolerate k faults you need k plus 1 replica to tolerate k faults okay so you so long as at least one process is up or one replica is up you can produce results okay as a very straightforward Uh, thing so if k is equal to one, okay, that means that 
you have to have two copies running okay? so that if one of them crashes the other one takes over. that's the most simplest case you will see in many systems okay? typically you can have k greater than one but k equal to one is a common case so you want to have one fault tolerance system which means one fault can occur or one failure can occur, okay? now let's take the other case which is byzantine fault tolerance okay? in byzantine fault tolerance processes can continue to run even if they are faulty okay so now if you want to tolerate k faults okay it's not adequate to just have k plus 1 replicas because you don't know whether a process is faulty or not in crash fault tolerance you know a process is not working because it has crashed okay not producing output okay so in Byzantine fault tolerance, all the processes seem up, they are all producing output when you send them a request. So, you can't tell whether a process is faulty or not just because it's up and down. Okay? So, we need an additional degree of redundancy as we will see and we will have to ask that question, how many additional replicas do you need to tolerate K Byzantine fault? To tolerate K crash faults, you just need K plus 1. To tolerate K Byzantine faults, you need lot more as we will see because these types of failures are difficult to actually detect and overcome. Okay, so, you might just have processes that are producing incorrect results to confuse the system. Okay. So, let us now talk about Byzantine faults. Okay. We will talk about several different scenarios. Okay. The first scenario is where the network is the, the part of the system that is faulty, the processes are actually fine. Okay. So, what does that mean? process A in a distributed application sending a message to process B, we can assume that the network can do arbitrary things to the message. It can drop the message, never deliver it or it can actually change the message and deliver a, a bad message. Okay, so, you might send one RPC request but the, the request might be changed by the network and essentially something else actually arrives at the other end. So, in some sense there is an adversary that is sitting in the network can intercept messages, change them and so on. Okay? So, then the question is how do you actually overcome this type of faults? Okay? We will analyze this with a very simple scenario where you have two processes okay? and one a network between them. Okay? And these two processes are simply sending a one bit between across one another. So, they can either send a 0 or a 1. Okay? So, it is a one bit message, it is the most simple message that you can send. Okay? And the question is can they both agree on what the message is that was sent and they know that the message was sent successfully. Okay? And we will assume the network as in this case is Byzantine faulty, so it can do anything. It can take a message, not deliver it. Okay? It can take a message that is 0 and turn it into 1 and deliver a 1 or it can take a message that is 1 deliver a 0 or it can deliver the message exactly as is without doing anything. Okay? So, at any time it can do any, any arbitrary thing it needs. So, it, can, it wants to do and you still want to communicate in a reliable manner. Okay. Is this clear, clear what we are trying to do? Okay. So, in this case network is faulty, the processes are fine and the question is can we actually uh, reach agreement which means we agreement basically means both processes know this was the message that was sent and the message was delivered successfully that the network did not do something bad to the message. Okay. So, we will uh, take this pro problem and try to actually conceptualize it in terms of uh, what is called a two generals problem. Okay? So, here we are assuming a scenario where there are two armies trying to attack one another. Oh, sorry, not attack one another. Two armies trying to attack a common enemy. So, they want to coordinate okay? what time it is that they should launch an attack. Okay? And the assumption is the way they are going to coordinate is they are going to send a messenger back and forth to actually try to decide what is the time that they want to attack. Yes, you have a question. Okay, so we will, yeah, okay, that, okay, so that is a good question point which is the network is the issue, can you not use cryptography and so on, right? You can use cryptography, but you can't deal with a network that doesn't deliver messages at all, right? So, you can because anything can happen. Network can just say it will drop messages. So, so, so we will try to understand what you just said 
uh, in, the, in a more simpler way without any cryptography. Okay, so two armies are waiting to attack a common enemy. They want to coordinate the time of the attack and they are going to essentially send a messenger back in. Okay? And the messenger has to go through hostile territory. Okay? So you send a messenger saying, let's attack tomorrow at 9 a.m. You don't know whether the message was delivered because the messenger could be caught okay, while they are trying to deliver the message. The messenger could be caught and a, a different messenger who is trying to masquerade as the original messenger might deliver a fake message. So you don't know what is going to happen. Okay? You just send a messenger out. Okay, you don't know whether the message was received and things of like that. But, but you need to reach agreement. Okay, the agreement here means you need to know that your message was actually received at the other end and received success. Okay. The question is, how are we going to actually do this? Okay. Let's say we have, we'll call them army A and B. A sends a message to B saying, let's attack at a certain time. Okay. Let's say for sake of argument that the messenger actually went and delivered the message. The message was not lost. Okay. Now the question is, does that mean we solved the problem? And the two armies now decide that they have actually agreed on what time to attack. Okay, I'm just saying the mess there's no message loss, there's no change of message, the messenger just made it to the other end. Does that address the problem? No, why not? Okay. The other process has to agree. Let's say the other process says fine. Right, it's fine as in it will take whatever time came and say, let's do it. Okay, so let's not worry about that. The processes are actually operating without any faults here. Okay. So the question that you should ask is, how does A know that the message was actually received? So A just sent a messenger. I just told you that the message actually reached. But how does A know that the message reached and it can actually go ahead and launch an attack at whatever the time is? Okay, so he doesn't know whether the messenger was intercepted okay, or, or received a, or, or, or delivered the message. So what, what can we do? Okay. We'll copy TCP and then we'll do what? Okay. So you, what can you do? You can send an acknowledgement. You can basically tell the messenger saying, go back and say that you delivered the message successfully. That's an act. Okay. So let's assume again for sake of argument, that the message actually comes back, the messenger rather, comes back successfully and said, I went and delivered the message and I want to come back and say that, uh, that I did that successfully. Okay. So now you sent a message, you got an acknowledgement. Are we done now? Did we solve the problem? And the two generals say, yes, we can now launch an attack. Yes. So the question point is now, how does the second army know that the act was received? Because it has to know that the act was received, otherwise it can't launch an attack because they don't, you don't know that the other army know, now knows that you got the message and the act was received. Okay, so now what? You will send an act to the act. Can we not multicast an acknowledgement to from the messenger? What does that mean? I mean, think of a real scenario, right? The messenger can only go back and forth. So it's similar to that, right? Can't do a multicast. So you will you can send an act acknowledgement to the acknowledgement. The messenger can go all the way back saying, I deliver the message that I delivered was acknowledged, and I'm sending an act to that. Okay. But that problem is never going to go away because you never know whether your original message was received or the act was received or the act to the act was received because you'll have to just continue recursively sending acts to acts and acts to acts to acts and never actually get to a point where both parties know that it's we have now agreement on what to do. Okay, is that clear? What I just said. So what what this is saying is a very simple property. It says that two perfect processes cannot reach agreement if the channel is unreliable. Okay? So this, in some sense, this, is, this problem cannot actually be solved. You cannot reach agreement if the network is the 
problem. Okay, the processes are fine. Okay, so that's basically an impossibility result. And I just gave you a very simple example of why you cannot. Do. And the point is, what you want to do is the agreement here means you want to get to what is called common knowledge. Common knowledge essentially means that you know something and you know that everyone else knows that same thing. Okay, and everybody else also knows the same thing. Okay, that means that it's now common knowledge. And you cannot reach common knowledge because every time you're trying to send a message or send an acknowledgement, there's always a chance that that message does not reach. Okay? So you actually never get to a point where you're common knowledge. Okay? So this problem we cannot solve. Okay? The network is the problem, is a hard, hard issue. You cannot actually deal with this. Okay? Even cryptography, as you were saying, doesn't help because this is an acknowledgement issue. Right? You cannot actually figure out whether the message even got there or that got there. All right. So, so now we want, yes, your question. Okay, question is why are two not, acts not sufficient in the two generals problem? First thing is TCP has only one act, not two. And you send a message, you get an acknowledgement. Okay? Even if you have a version where you send an act to the act, you have to think recursively, right? So if you just look at, think about this problem that I was explaining, okay, two armies are trying to get agreement okay, on whether to launch an attack. You first send a message, okay? And you need to know whether the message was successfully received. So only then you can launch an attack. Otherwise, you don't know if the message was not received and you launch the attack, then the other army is not going to launch the attack, right? So then your coordination didn't work. So you have to wait for an acknowledgement to come back so that you know that the message was successfully received. When the act is successfully received, what you know is that the message went there and it came and you got an act. So you know the other party knows. So you can launch the attack, but the other party does not know whether you got the act. So they can't launch the attack because if the act was not delivered and they launch the attack, then the other party won't. So you will you can reason this recursively and you will see you'll never reach agreement. Okay? That's the problem. We in TCP we are not trying to reach agreement. We just want to know if the message was received successfully, but it's not the problem of you're trying to coordinate something. Okay? You just want to know if the message was delivered or not, an act is adequate. Okay? Here we are trying to actually reach agreement, which is not the same problem as did the message get delivered. Right? Okay. So that's the two generals problem. Now we will try to solve a different problem. So in this case, we will assume that the network is reliable. There's no problem. We'll assume that you can use TCP or whatever we want. The network is not the problem, but one of the processes is actually faulty. This is the problem that we were trying to address. So you have n replicas. Okay? In this case, we'll assume one replica is faulty. Okay? You don't know which one. Okay? So this is now, there are n generals. Okay? And we'll assume that in this case, one general is a traitor. They are trying to confuse. So the N generals are trying to reach agreement on when to launch an attack. There's one general that's a traitor. What the, the general can do arbitrary things. They can send wrong messages. They can send the right message. They can send different messages to different generals and cause confusion. Okay? And here we want to see, can we reach agreement on when to launch the attack? If some subset are faulty, we'll start with an example of one. But in general, uh, the general problem is M out of N may be traitors or faulty. So traitor is exactly what a Byzantine fault is. Okay? They can do arbitrarily malicious things just to confuse every other process. Okay? Like unless, unlike a crash process where you don't send any messages, a traitor process or a Byzantine faulty process can send arbitrary messages. Okay? And yet we want to reach agreement. Is the problem clear? We'll see how to solve it. Okay? Here's the example. We'll start with a case where there are four generals, which we'll call one, two, three, and four. There are four processes. Okay? We know that three is the faulty process, okay? but the generals don't know that okay? because they're just receiving messages. They don't know that there is a traitor or who the traitor is. Okay? So we got to figure out, okay, reach agreement and try to isolate the traitor. Yes, so this is going to be a recursive algorithm by in Lamports. Okay? So here is how it's going to work. Each general is going to send a message. Okay? What you are trying to reach agreement on is not an issue. Okay? You can try to agree on what time to launch an attack or what you can agree on how many soldiers each of the generals have. Okay? So the 
so that's really not the problem of what you are trying to reach agreement the question is how to reach agreement so in this example we are assuming that traitors are uh, not traitors generals are trying to tell others even in the presence of traitors what their army strength is okay but it could be anything you could have said this is the time you want to attack or something like so 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 we'll have a two round process to figure this out in round 1 each process is going to broadcast its strength to other pro generals so you will say okay, so in this case general 1 is going to say i have one soldier it doesn't matter how many soldiers there so you will say i have one soldier you send that message to everybody okay general 2 sends a message saying i have two soldiers okay general 3 is the faulty process it can send arbitrary messages so we we'll, so we'll just say it sends x to 1 y to 2 and z to Four, which are arbitrary integers. They could be the same integer. They could be different integers. We don't know what it's trying to do. So we'll assume it sends arbitrary message. Okay, x, y, and z are variables that can take any values. They can be equal. It might confuse things by actually sending a valid message, an invalid message, different messages. So it can do whatever it. Okay, and four is going to send four to all the other children. Okay, so at the end of round one, okay. what is shown in b is the messages that you have received okay so you will one will have gotten one because it knows what it does one from its, itself two from two y from x from 3 and four from four okay and two would have gotten one two y four three would have gotten the right things because it knows what it has and four got one two z and four okay so that is the information each other general has okay they don't know which of this is correct information which of this incorrect info this is just what you received from the other generals okay now you got to figure out okay, who is the is there a traitor and who it is okay so what will you do you will take whatever messages you received okay and you will broadcast it back saying this is what i got in the previous round is that clear what i just said so you know, so you will basically send 1 to x and 4 and 2 will send 1 to y 4 and so on three can again send confusing messages so it may send a b c d to one and it may say e f g h to someone else and whatever it wants to the third one okay so after the first second round this is what each of them would have received so one would have gotten 1 to y 4 from 2 it would have gotten a b c d from 3 it would have gotten 1 to z 4 from 3 okay and so on okay so now if you look at this messages what does that tell you you can isolate which are the rows and columns that don't match okay you will see that the the row column from 3 is not matching because it may have sent diff different things and then it could have sent a b c d so you will know that 3 is trying to confuse matters because it's sending wrong messages to everyone else and others have now reported the messages they have received so you can identify which is the faulty process okay and then essentially ignore what it's saying and try to reach agreement on the rest yes question the question is what is it that you are sending in round 2 if i were to summarize the question so you send all the information you received from every process in the previous round you are broadcasting everything not just what you what you sent so if you you, you will send 1 2 x 4 like one that's the message that one is going to send okay two is going to send 1 2 y 4 to everyone to every every other process okay which is why in round 2 you basically get what everyone received in the previous round Okay, so you will the first round you are getting a single integer. The second round you are getting a vector with four values. Okay, Is this clear? Okay, so in two rounds, in this case, in two rounds, we were able to identify a traitor and we were able to reach agreement because other processes are reporting the right values. Yes, your question. Okay. so you saying if there are two faulty processes yeah okay so quite okay so question what happens if there are two faulty processes okay so this only works if there's one faulty process if you want to deal with two faults you will need more replicas okay so 
So as you will see, what I'm going to show you on the next slide, we'll gen not next slide, but I'll show you another example. Then we'll generalize this to see how many replicas do you need to tolerate K faults. Okay? Here K was one. If you have two faulty processes, you will never reach agreement because there will be multiple rows and columns that don't match. You don't know what is happening. Okay? You will not understand who are the who is reporting the right value, who not reporting the right value. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Question is: Can the faulty process send incorrect, same incorrect message? So if you send the same incorrect message, you are acting like a normal process in this case. So you will actually not be identified, nor you will be isolated. Okay? But that's okay. Because you could think about this as, to, uh, to answer your question, let's say you are you're, you're not actually broadcasting the strength of your army, but you are doing a computation. Let's say you are running the add process. Okay? And all the processes have been asked to add 2 plus 2 and try to arrive at the answer. Okay, so now you are basically broadcasting the result of your add function as opposed to this. So you will basically send to to x4, right, x2 and so on. So in this case, if the faulty process sends 2 plus 2 is 4 to everyone, that's okay. It sent the correct message, doesn't it? But if you say 2 plus 2 is 5, okay, the others will say 2 plus 2 is 4. So you have three processes agreeing that 2 plus 2 is 4 and one is sending 5. And you can still figure out that it's actually incorrect even though it sends the same wrong message to others. Okay? So depending on what you're trying to do, you can actually send the same incorrect message and still get idea. If you send the same correct message, then it's okay. So then you perform the computation correctly. Is this clear? Any questions here? Okay. So we'll repeat the same problem now, but we'll assume that there are only three generals, not four. Okay? And three is still the faulty process. Okay. So what, what happens in this case, the same, same example, right? So the first round, one is going to send one to everyone, two sends two, and three is sending X and Y, okay? So you are basically going to get one to X, one to Y, one to three, okay? And then you are going to recurse, and you are going to send this out, and you will have, in the next round, you got one to Y, A, B, C from three, and two got one to X, D, F, three gets whatever it gets, right? So now you will see that, the message that each general, each correct general, which is one and two, you will see that it's getting two different messages. Okay? It gets something from two, like one is getting something from two and something else from three. They don't match. Okay? Because one to Y may not match with ABC if two has sent arbitrary values or substitute arbitrary integers. Okay? So you know that there is a faulty process that's sending bad messages. But you don't know which one is faulty. So, so you can't actually isolate in this case. You can detect that there is a fault, but you can't isolate the faulty process and ignore it, which you could do and there was one more process in the previous example. Is this clear? Okay. So this is very similar to your two friends. You ask them for some information. Okay. One of them lies to you. Okay. So their answers don't match. But you don't know who is lying because you don't have any other information to figure out okay, what, what, whom to believe or not to believe. Okay. But you have three friends and you ask them the same question and one of them lies, the other two are going to say the right, the truth and then the third person, the liar gets isolated. It is the same problem. Okay. Here. So, the, so each general needs actually three other processes, one of whom is the traitor to make sure you can isolate the traitor. If you only have two other processes, they, are, they produce two different responses, you can't figure out which one is correct and agree with the right, that one. Okay. Is this clear? Yes. So you are saying you can send a string, then what happens? I don't understand what you're going to do. Right. So this is a protocol that should work for any arbitrary thing. So you can say this could be a database, right? The, the generals are databases. You are sending a query. Okay? One of the databases is faulty and it produces garbage results for the query, right? 
and then you want to figure out which is the bad one and try to isolate or it could be a, a web service where you're sending requests one of them is faulty it's sending bad responses okay so it could be any scenario you still want this protocol to work okay in this case we were just having uh, using a very simple example of an army and so on but in reality it is a distributed system where the processes are replicas that are performing an arbitrary computation one of them is faulty you have to figure out which one and isolate it and still have the system continue to run that's the goal right so maybe the very special case you mentioned might work but this has to work in the general case so your question is yes uh, why not use the uh, based on that one class and for example in one class so I didn't understand what you're saying. So you said you can take what you got and compare it with two. That's yes. two's response. Yes, like one card, one two X. Yes. And then we can put it in the another row, one card, and pair it with the X and then we got to one. No, I don't think it still work actually because it's same problem as because you're trying remember you're trying to reach agreement so you are basically trying to say what is it that you should agree on if you have one process that disagrees with the other one you don't have it okay so it's not going to work actually you can detect that there is a problem because there is no agreement no not not agreement there's no match between the responses but you can't figure out which of the two to believe in this case one got one to X, yes, in the first round. Then one got one to Y. That yes, is. yes. So Still don't understand how that actually helps figure out who is the faulty process, right? Because you are assuming that you are, everybody else also has to agree on the same thing, right? So you have to assume that you, it's a, that process may also be faulty in some cases, right? So, so it will not actually get you what you are saying. Okay, maybe we can talk after class so that you can explain what you are saying a little more. But but the the property here that you want to keep uh, keep in mind is if there are m faulty processes, okay, agreement is possible only if there is a two thirds greater than two thirds majority. Okay, so you want two m plus one processes to be working pro correctly out of and uh, out of three m plus one. So, so in other words, the other way to say this is, if you, have, if you want to tolerate M Byzantine faults, you need three M plus one replicas, okay? Then M was one, okay? You need four replicas, okay? Which is what we had in the previous case, okay? So essentially of those four, there's one faulty and three correct. If M is two, okay, you will need seven replicas to solve the same problem because you have to now isolate two faulty processes, okay? out of in this case seven okay so essentially the degree of replication is at least three m plus one okay? which is a very high cost if you can think about this so to tolerate one fault you have four times the cost you'll have four servers running four replicas running just to tolerate one fault. in crash fault tolerance you want to tolerate one fault you need two replicas right you want whether so one fails the other one works in byzantine faults you want to tolerate one fault Four replicas, okay? Four x cost, okay? which is a very high price to pay. Okay, most real systems will not want to pay such a high cost, so they may not actually be able to deal with Byzantine fault tolerance. Okay, except things like blockchains and so on that want consensus even in the presence of Byzantine fault. So you want Byzantine consensus and things of that sort. You will pay that high price. But other systems like web servers or things like that, they often deal with crash fault tolerance, but not Byzantine fault tolerance. Okay, so you need more than two third processes to correct to work correctly to actually get this property. Okay, so that's a high price to pay. Okay, so this is what I was saying in this. Uh, what I just said is actually reflected in this slide. Saying detecting crash faults much easier. Okay, k plus one. Detecting that there is a Byzantine fault. Okay, two k plus one. Okay, which is this. 
That's just detecting, not isolating. So you know that there is a fault because there's no agreement. Right? You can't figure out what is right and what is wrong. Okay, And then reaching agreement after detect requires 3K plus. Okay? So essentially you need two-third majority to eliminate the faulty rim. So you have crash fault tolerance K plus 1. Okay? In Byzantine fault, just to detect that there is a fault, 2K plus 1. So if you want to detect and recover, you need 3K plus Okay, so there's a lot of replication that you have to do in order to deal with this in detail. Is this clear? Okay. All right. So, and you already said if the network is faulty, okay, that's a bigger problem that we can't even deal with. So, if the same thing you can say if the network is actually not necessarily faulty but slow, okay, you still have a problem. Because if the network is slow, you cannot distinguish between a failed process and a very slow process. Okay? You send a message, it takes an arbitrarily long time for a reply to come back because the network is arbitrarily slow. You don't know if the process actually failed and hence the response hasn't come back or the network is just slow. Okay? So when there are network issues, I think this problem gets even harder because you cannot distinguish slow processes from faulty. Okay? So Byzantine fault tolerance, has been an area of research for a long time and because there is a very high cost, there have been all kinds of techniques that people have come up with and can you reduce that overhead. That's a, that's a fundamental limit, but if you make certain assumptions, you can relax that 3K plus 1 bound. So, for example, if you say only some of the nodes are Byzantine, but others are collaborative, you trust some nodes more than others, maybe you can reduce the cost and things of that sort. But you need to make additional assumptions. If you assume that any node can be faulty, then you are stuck with the 3M plus. Okay? And this area has now again gotten a lot of attention once uh, things like blockchain became popular. Because in blockchain, you actually need to reach Byzantine consensus because there are arbitrary processes that are mining whatever cryptocurrencies and participating in a consensus protocol. You can assume that there are people willing to do bad things. Okay? So you want to reach consensus even if some subset of the nodes are actually doing arbitrarily bad things. So all, all of these protocols in the past 5 or 8, 10 years have again become really popular in terms of how do you reduce the cost and what assumptions to make and so on. Is this clear now? Okay. So that is what I wanted to say on Byzantine fault tolerance. We will come back to some of this when we come to consensus okay, in the next class. But what I'd want to do today is to just do a recap, a one slide recap of something we discussed back in lecture three, okay, which was reliable one-to-one -one communication. When we were talking about remote procedure calls, if you remember we said, that there, how do you have a reliable RPC, even in the presence of various kinds of faults where the client may have failed, the server may have failed, the request or the network didn't get delivered, the response did not get delivered. And we looked at various approaches to deal with those uh, types of faults. And those were all crash faults in some sense. Either the network crashed or not crashed. The network just failed to deliver a message. Okay? Or the server crashed or the client crashed. We didn't need to reach agreement or anything like that. We just needed to make sure a response comes back. Much simpler problem to deal with. Okay? But just keep that in mind, so what we talked about at that time. A lot of this we could deal with TCP because TCP takes care of the networking problem. Okay? It will retransmit my packets until they are received and you get an acknowledgement so you don't need to deal with it. Okay? But if you now have many to one communication, okay, then you have a slightly different problem. So this is many to one communication is called multicast. Okay? In multicast, you have one sender, multiple receivers. You make a send and multiple nodes receive it. Okay? So, uh, here we now want to ask the question, what can we do if there are lost messages? Okay? You send a message, it has to go to N receivers, or only some subset of them can. Okay? Just as TCP time has a timeout, if you don't get an acknowledgement, you time out and retransmit, you will need some form of retransmission. Okay? So the simplest extension you can make okay, in this case is to say, when I send a multicast a message, each receiver should send me an ACK. Okay? So I send a message, it gets to end receivers. All of them need to send an acknowledgement to me. So I know that everyone received. Okay? That's the same as TCP. There's only two uh, 
entity is there. You send a message, you get an act to make sure the other party receives. Okay. So you could just have an act-based scheme okay, for multicast. But act, in an act-based scheme, okay, what can happen is you will actually have a bottleneck at the sender as the size of the group increases. And that is the example that's actually shown here, okay, where this is the sender node. Okay, there are four receiver nodes. Okay, and the sender has sent message number 25, okay, M25 is message number 25 to all of the receivers. Okay, and then you are waiting for acknowledgement. Okay, so in this case, if you have N uh, members in the group, you will receive N acknowledgements. Okay, but N can be arbitrary. Okay, N could be 10,000. So you may be sending uh, a multicast message to 10,000 receivers. So for every message you send, you get 10,000 acts back in this case. Okay? So that increases the overhead of act processing on the sender because the sender has to track every receiver saying who has received it, who has not received it, who, and then either time out and send a request and so on. Okay? So not send a request, but retransmit the request and so on. Okay? So this is called the act explosion problem. Okay? So as the size of the multicast group grows, Simple act-based scheme that work really well in TCP don't really work well if you are just trying to get reliability for multi because you will get a lot of acts. Okay? So what people have done is they have essentially a different approach which is called a NAC-based scheme. NAC stands for a negative acknowledgement. Okay? What's a negative acknowledgement? It's basically the opposite of an acknowledgement. You send a NAC only if you know you did not get something. Okay? If you receive messages, you don't send anything. If you miss a message, you are going to send something. Okay? What does that even mean? Okay, let's take the same example. Let's say that the messages you are sending are numbered. Okay, so you not only send the message, but you actually have a sequence number on them. So you know which message you received. So we, in this example here, okay, every receiver has received all the messages through message number 24. So that's why it is last equal to 24. Okay? The sender is trying to send message number 25. So 25 gets to all the receivers successfully, okay? but there is one receiver that had not received 24. So its last was 23, you'll see here. Okay? The others received 24. So when message number 25 arrives at the receiver, it'll say, the last message I received is 23. Now I got 25, so I missed a message. Okay? So you're going to send a NAC for that message saying, yeah, so you'll see now that it's sending out a NAC saying, I need message 24. Okay? The NAC can only go to the sender or it can go to some others in the group if they are caching messages so you can get it from some other nearby node rather than all the way from the sender. But that's a detail. The more important part is you are going to send out a NAC and then you are going to ask for that message to be retransmitted explicitly. As opposed to an ACK and a timeout, you essentially send NAC. Okay? So if you have a scenario where the network is only dropping messages for a small subset of your nodes, a NAC based scheme will be more efficient because for every message, you will only get a small number of NACs as opposed to a large number of ACs. Okay? So that's more efficient. If you have a really lossy network, then this problem is not going to, the, the NAC is not going to solve anything because you may get lots of NACs every time you try to send them. But we assume that the network by and large is well behaved and only occasionally drops packets. In this case, a NAC based scheme will be a lot more efficient than an ACK based. Yes, question. Okay. Yeah, so question is, are you queuing the messages at each of the receivers and you act, uh, deliver them in the same order and if you know you missed it, can you not ask someone else, right? So, so all of this is true. The way either TCP would work or even in this case multicast would work, you are going to deliver messages in order. Because we will assume that network can sometimes even reorder messages and things of that. So, so you will essentially not deliver messages to applications out of order. You're not going to deliver message 22 and then you go deliver 19 and 23. They're arriving out of order. You keep a buffer in the operating system. Okay? So all of this is actually happening in the OS, not at the application. Messages come in. You look at the sequence number. You order them. 
and so long as they are arriving in order, you deliver them in order. Okay? So if you have received 23 and then you receive 25, you don't deliver 25 and wait for 24 to come later. You will essentially buffer 25, okay? request, send a NAC, request 24, wait for 24 to come. And then now you have a, all of the messages in order, then you will deliver 24 and 25. Okay? That's the first thing. The second thing, who can you ask for 24? As is shown in this example, okay, you can send a NAC back to the sender. The sender is already buffering. So that's why there's a buffer history that is keeping a buffer of all the messages. So you can resend the messages if NACs are received. Okay? That's number one. Second is you don't only have to send that NAC to the sender. You can send it to the sender and some subset of the receivers. If the receivers are closer to you than the sender then the, the last message comes back faster than asking a far away server to resend it to, which is why you will see in this figure, the NAC is actually going to the entire group of receivers as well as the sender. You don't have to send it to everyone, but in this simple example, it is being sent to every other node saying, if you have message 24, send it. Okay, so both of those things will be true for efficiency reasons. Okay, there's only one problem in NAC-based scheme, which is, you send the final message in a sequence, okay? there is no message after that to get a NAC. Okay? So you might have to add a dummy message after your last message just to make sure you get NAC for the last real message so you can actually send the NAC. Okay? Is that clear? All right. So we'll talk a little bit about various facets of multicast before we get to distributed commit. So what, what I showed you was a very simple multicast based approach that is just sending messages, getting uh, negative acknowledgements and retransmitting lost messages and so on. But there are many properties sometimes you might need on your broadcast on multicast messages in addition to resending lost messages. Okay? And one is to ensure that you have ordered delivery. Right? So, so that is essentially called FIFO broadcast or FIFO multicast, which simply says if a, if a single process sends M1 and M2, then all other processes should receive M1 before M2. Okay? So some of this you can reorder in the OS buffer because you are sending them in sequence numbers, uh, using sequence number, you can order them and make sure you, uh, you deliver them in order and so on. But if you have actually a multicast library that ensures this for you, then you don't need to worry about does the OS deal with it all. Okay, so, so you can have these systems that actually guarantee you FIFO delivery. Okay, that's the simplest one. The more complex one is totally ordered delivery, which says that if a process receives M1 before M2, okay, and then other processes also receive M1 before it. Okay, because those are that basically those get ordered. So essentially, total ordering is harder because now you are trying to order messages across processes. Very similar to how Lamport's clock was trying to order events across processes. Okay? So in some sense, we are saying if two messages have an ordering on them based on, let's say, Lamport's clock or Vector's clock, you want to make sure that the, those messages are delivered in that order to all the, all the processes. Okay? And that kind of is also mentioned here. Causally ordered, totally ordered says everything as a order, which is much harder. But causally ordered says if send of M1 happened before send of M2, these are two messages that are ordered explicitly using causal relationship or the happened before relationship, then the receive of M1 also has to happen before receive. If you send one message before the other, that message has to be received before the second message. Okay? That's a much harder property to guarantee because if you imagine in the internet message, Delays can be arbitrary. Okay? So you will have to have additional information to know what the ordering was, buffer them for extra amounts of time if you get them out of order. Okay? Because you are just not ordering by sequence number. So we are imposing additional ordering conditions on message delivery, which is saying this causal relationship between messages and enforce those causal relationships. Okay? And then many others. Okay? So there will be a whole slew of this. We'll talk about one or two examples in the next couple slides. Okay? The first one is called atomic multicast. Okay? So atomic multicast is a property that guarantees you atomicity on top of everything else. Okay? What does atomicity mean? If I send a message to a group, okay? 
either all the processes in the group receive the message or no one receives the message. Same as transaction, if you remember transactions had an all or nothing property. Everything in the transaction either executes or nothing executes. You can't have half the code in the transaction execute. That thing doesn't exist when you have transaction. Same thing is true here. Okay? In atomic multicast, you are going to guarantee that every process in your group has gotten a message or no one. So if some subset of them get the message and someone else crashes, you have to essentially throw that message out and make sure that you undo the delivery saying nobody received. So you can't have a case where some half of them or 80% of them receive it. Okay. So, so this is important because we have things like replicated databases. Remember replicated databases, I gave that banking example. If you had an atomic multicast, okay, so you basically send a query, either every replica gets the query and executes it or nobody gets it. Okay. So this ensures that you don't have a case where some replicas have gotten a tra transaction and executed, others have not executed. So it's an all or nothing property that you will get. Okay. Now, that's just an idea. The question is how are you going to implement atomic multicast? It's a complicated problem. Okay. So the, there's one multiple approaches, but that's one we are going to look at it here, which is called the group view approach. Okay. The idea here is the way you are going to enforce all or nothing property is to actually track whether the group membership has changed as some process crashed or disappeared in the group. Okay. So long as the group is static, okay, the network using TCP can deliver your message successfully. Okay. So you get the all property. But in the midst of delivering a message, if some process crashes, okay, you will have what is called a group change or a view change. Say that now the group membership has changed, there's one process disappeared. So then you got to track that and make sure that you will actually undo the delivery of so you are essentially going to have to layer, uh, add a layer on top of multicast which says I am going to track group membership okay? and group membership cannot change while there is a delivery of a message in progress. Okay? So if there is a process changes, uh, uh, not process, the group changes during a delivery then you are going to undo the delivery of that message. Okay? So you will see here that one process crashes or so the group has changed. Okay? So either in that case, you undo the delivery of the message, you resend the message with the new group if you want, and then that will go to the new group and so on. Okay, so, so this requires you to have this notion of tracking which processes are present, make sure the group changes are done in a reasonable way and so on. Okay? There is a system here uh, that implemented it, okay? the name of the system is actually ISIS, unfortunate name. The name was actually designed well before anything that you heard of ISIS, but that's what that system is called, which implemented this whole idea. Okay? So you will see here that same example I mentioned. So there's a group of seven processes. Okay? One of them crashes. Okay? Process four observes it and says that there is a change of group membership. It essentially broadcasts that change, which may cause unsent messages to be flushed. Okay? And then once the group is stabilized in that, you say, now this is the new group. Then if you agree with that group, then you can start broadcasting to that smaller group or you will start to wait until the process recovers. Yes, question. Okay. Question, how do you know which processes are present and which ones are not present? So this requires you to implement all kinds of things underneath which detects process failures. Okay. And so you will have to send what are called heartbeat messages or other techniques to know uh, am I alive messages or are you alive messages? Not am I alive messages. Are you alive messages saying uh, is the process up or not to actually track which nodes are up, which nodes are down, whether the node has recovered and things of that. None of that is being shown here. I'm just assuming that you can detect faults. Okay, these are crash faults, not Byzantine faults. So they are much easier to detect. You can send your ping or heartbeat messages if you don't hear back. You assume process crashed, group check. That's going to be the same thing you do for your lab, incidentally, right? You have to, in lab three, you have to have fault tolerance, so you have to detect when a process has gone down, okay, on a replica and make sure that you can then send the message to other replicas and so on. Okay? So, yes, so there's all, all sorts of details here that we are glossing over, okay? But the higher level idea is you've got to track processes which are up and down and then make sure you track this group change. Okay? All right. So, so I'm not going to go through this table here, but the, all I wanted to 
show with the table is multicasting comes in many different flavors. Okay? And we only looked at two or three of these today. We talked about reliable multicast very briefly, which is very simple, which says, I just want to make sure when I send a message, everybody gets it and I can retransmit message. It does not guarantee any ordering problem. Okay? All it's doing is it's making sure that any packet losses you can deal with by retransmission using NACs. Okay? But then all of these other ones, okay, or, or the ones in the middle, FIFO, causal, et okay? So those actually impose and ordering on top of reliable. So saying that you want to deliver messages in a certain order, in addition to making sure the messages get there, you want to impose an order. Okay. Atomicity adds one more property on top saying, not only do I want to make sure that messages are delivered in a certain order, I want to guarantee an all or nothing property on every send. Okay. So I don't want a case where some of process crashes and the message does not get delivered. So, so, th so that's stricter than the other two. And then there are, of course, different flavors of atomic multicast, which I didn't talk about. You can do FIFO atomic. So you have ordering and atomicity guarantees combined. Okay? So many different flavors gets very complicated. We are not going to deal with most of this. You have the basic idea. I think that's enough for the course. Okay, all right. So I'm going to now talk about the last problem briefly. We'll continue this in the next class. We won't be able to finish everything here today. Okay? But I'll introduce this problem of distributed commit. Okay? So distributed commit generalizes the problem of atomic multicast where we were trying to do all or nothing. Okay? So, so there are many scenarios where a group of processes in a distributed system must either all perform an operation or no one performs the operation. That's a nice property to have if you want to maintain consistency or you have replicated databases and things like that. Okay? So reliable multicast was just one example where the operation you are concerned about is the delivery of the message. Either everyone gets that message or no one gets it. That's the operation you cared about. But you could think of many other scenarios and we already looked at another example, which is distributed transactions where either all the replicas do the transaction, or none of them. Right? So, so there are many cases like this where you want an all or nothing property on an arbitrary operation. What the operation is, we don't care. Okay? It's some operation and either all the processes in the group have to finish or no one finishes. You can't have some processes doing it or others not. This problem is called distributed commit, where the commit says that everybody agrees to have finished the trans or that operation successfully. And you want to do this in a distributed manner. Okay? So how do you solve the problem of distributed commit where we have agreement on whether everyone has completed that operation. And if there's no agreement, then you essentially undo and abort. Say that nobody, so undo whatever you did. Okay? It's similar to how you did this in transaction. Now the operation is no longer just a transaction. It could be any operation that you want to use for distributed commit. Okay? So we'll look at two techniques. Okay? Today we are going to look at two-phase commit okay? called 2PC. Okay? And then next time we are going to look at three-phase commit or 3PC. Okay? Do not confuse two-phase commit with two-phase locking. Okay? When we did concurrency control, there was some locking techniques we talked about, which was called two-phase locks. Okay? Okay, here we are talking about two-phase commit. The word two-phase appears in them, but they're completely different concepts. So they just have two phases in what they do, which is why they're called two-phase locking or two-phase commit. But beyond that, there is no real similar uh, relationship between them. Okay? So here we'll talk about the problem of distributed commit and we'll have two rounds, which is why it's called two phases. And then in three phase, you'll say there are three rounds to actually get to commit. Okay? So the two phase commit, the technique is actually fairly straightforward, but arguing for correctness, saying that no matter which process crashes, what happens, we still get to a correct state, a little bit harder and more involved. Okay? The book actually has a textbook as a, a two or three page description of it. You should go and read it if you want to know about that in more detail, but I'm going to explain the basics. Okay? So the, the understanding the process is very simple. There's a two phases or two rounds in which we are going to figure out whether to commit an operation or undo the operation. Okay? So essentially, we'll start with a coordinator and multiple nodes. Okay? The coordinator is simply going to ask everyone to vote, should we commit or not commit? Everybody gets to vote. Okay? 
So the coordinate sends out a vote request saying, do you want to commit this operation or not commit the operation or abort the operation? Okay? So you get all the votes back. If every node says commit the operation, then you say, okay, we'll commit the operation. Okay? If any even one node says abort the operation and everyone else says commit, that's a veto. Okay? Because one node says it could not finish the operation successfully, it wants to abort, so then everybody has to undo. So if, there's, if there's the vote result has a single abort, then one or more aborts, you abort. If everybody says commit, you commit. Okay? So in round two, you are then going to then tell everyone what the results of the vote was. Okay? So that's the basic idea, but here is how it's going to work. Okay? There are some diagrams, figures here. Okay? You will see what is happening is this is the coordinator. Okay? These are other nodes, and there's a timing diagram that actually shows what is happening. So the first phase, you send a vote request. And then ask for the results of the vote. So you start from the init. So this is a state transition diagram. You start from an init state, and then you ask for whether you want to vote or not. Okay. And then you go, and the coordinator is going to go and go into a wait state. Okay. Then you wait to hear what to do. And if you essentially get an vote for an abort, then you basically go to the abort state, and everybody is going to abort. If everybody is voted to commit, you are going to the commit state. So here is essentially a state transition diagram of a, um, of any node. Okay, that was the coordinator. Okay, this is a node. The node is also initially in the init state. If it gets a vote request and it votes to abort, you can make a direct transition to abort. You know what the outcome of that vote is going to be because you already voted to abort. Okay? But if you vote to commit, you go into a ready state and you wait. Because you don't know what others have actually voted for, so you need to wait for the results of the election before you can decide what to do locally for your operation. Okay? And if the coordinator tells you to abort, you are going to send an abort. Coordinator tells you to commit, you are going to commit. So if you think about it, it's a very simple process. The coordinator asking everyone to vote based on the results of the vote, it tells everyone what to do. And each node, all it has to do is it has to wait for a request from the coordinator. It votes abort or commit. If you wait, vote for abort, you know what the outcome is. You can directly abort without even waiting for the vote results. But if you wait, vote to commit, you got to wait to hear the res election results, and then you commit or abort depending on the outcome. Okay. Yes. Question. Yeah. Yes. So the problem is that we got to discuss is what happens, uh, I will not look at the code right now, but that's exactly the issue. Because this is a distributed commit and you have an all or nothing property, you can never have a case where some process has crashed and you have a made a decision where some processes, some other processes end up in commit and someone else ends in abort. This can never happen. Then you don't have an all or nothing property. So put another way, this very simple two-phase voting protocol has to always end in a consistent state, no matter who crashes at what state. Coordinator can crash at any time. Okay? Processes can crash at any time. Okay? And you can't actually do anything in that case. So, so we got to analyze what can happen in this. So, so we'll actually take a look at the coordinator and say what happens when it crashes at each of these stages and so on. Right? So, so one. So in some sense, the problem with two-phase commit is if all the processes have voted and then the coordinator crashes but never sends the election result out, okay, what do you do? Okay, you could say, why not just ask all the other processes what they voted for and then decide what to do, which is the same as saying maybe you elect another coordinator. Okay? But you can't actually do that because a coordinator is also a process that voted. You don't know what it voted in that uh, for this operation. So if you don't know what it voted, you can't actually make a unilateral decision without that coordinator's vote as well. Okay? In that case, the coordinator is voting for itself, but it doesn't send the vote request. So if the coordinator crashes, okay, there are only a few things you can do. Okay? So if what you can do is, if the coordinator crashes, you can ask other nodes. If one of the other nodes has actually reached an end stage of a commit or an abort, you can still make a decision because if one pro you find a process that's in the abort state, you know that it has actually voted for an abort. That's the only way you will end here, right? So then you know, or you know that some other process actually voted for an abort, and this process got a 
what result from the coordinator it went to about regardless of what it is you know that is safe to abort and everyone else can abort it okay similarly if you find even one process in the commit stage okay commit end stage what you will, what you can infer from this is the coordinator got all the results okay and it essentially all the results are to commit and it sent started sending election results out and at least this process got the outcome of the election and maybe other processes didn't and the coordinator so now you at least know what the election result was and other processes can commit okay so when the coordinator crashes if you find at least one pro other process in the com commit stage or the abort stage it's safe for everyone else to actually make take that same decision okay but the problem will arise if the coordinator crashes and everyone is stuck in the ready state where you voted on the outcome of the election but you don't know what the outcome is in this case it's not safe for any of the processes to make a decision without the coordinator because remember the coordinator is also a voter in this case so you can't say what did you all vote and then you are taking a election result with n minus 1 processes and ignoring what the nth process wants to do because if you all say commit and that coordinator wanted to abort you will end up in a wrong state because the coordinator may itself have decided to abort right so you don't want that so if you are stuck in the ready state two phase commit is deadlock okay this has a deadlock problem you cannot make progress because you don't know what to do okay but if the coordinator crashes but you find some other process at one of the end stages you can make progress but but two phase commit has this deadlock problem okay the question is can you not discard the coordinator and elect a new coordinator and continue you can do that but you cannot figure out what to do with this operation you can do that for all subsequent operations because then the coordinator is crash not participating in any reason so there is no uh, risk of it making an incorrect decision but the question is what do you do for this operation so your deadlock for this operation you can continue for other operations right so you can say we leave out the coordinator now n minus 1 process is can agree that's okay but the point is that for this uh, operation you will still be deadlock until the coordinator comes back is that clear what i said okay so so this has actually quite a few subtle things this is the code of the pseudo code which you can look at uh, it's basically the two phase voting as you will see uh, that you essentially decide what the vote is and you send out responses and so on i will not go into this because i have explained what this is but here is essentially what i was talking about okay so if you actually uh, uh, essentially is, uh, if you are in the ready state okay and you are not heard from the coordinator coordinator is crashed you can contact some other process q and depending on its state you may or may not be able to en enter the final state so if you are if q is in the commit stage as i said you know that q received a vote from the coordinator to commit a result so you can commit q is in the abort state you know that the decision is to abort because at least q has voted to abort or q has received a election result abort you can make a okay, if you are in the init state you know that you haven't even voted okay so init is basically you are basically haven't even started so in this case there is no way the coordinator can make a decision because you know you have not voted so in this case also it's fine to abort and because you can essentially tell about and have everyone else about but if you are in the ready state and the other process is in the ready state you have to keep checking and if everyone ends up in ready then you are deadlocked and okay, that was the scenario i just mentioned okay so this is a two phase commit so it is safe in that if you are you enter a final state everyone is guaranteed to be in that final state you will never have a case where some processes commit other abort because that will not give you the all or nothing property okay so you will bear, you, so you will always have that property but okay, you are, so that's called a safety property safety property say nothing bad happens right so you will not have a scenario where you make different decisions but two phase commit because it can deadlock does not have what's called the liveness property liveness property says something good happens because in this case you may all be stuck and you cannot make progress so you are deadlock okay so safety property is not compromised we will not do anything bad but you may be deadlocked and you can't make progress in the system okay so we can talk about the three phase commit protocol that tries to address this coordinator failure problem 
but we will start talking about that next time. Okay, so we'll stop it here today and then continue with two phase, com uh, sorry, three phase commit. And then we'll also talk about consensus using Paxos and Raft next time. Right, so let's stop.